Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time. In each episode of this podcast, we invite a special guest to take us on a tailored tour of the past. Travels Through Time is brought to you in partnership with History Today, Britain's best loved serious history magazine. You can read articles relating to this podcast and more about our guests at historytoday.com forward slash travels. There is also a special subscription offer for Travels Through Time listeners. Three issues for just one pound each. To Septicius Clarus, how dare you? You promised to come to dinner, but never show up. Here's your sentence. You shall reimburse the full costs to the penny. They're not small. We had prepared a lettuce each, three snails, two eggs, spelt with honeyed wine and snow. You shall pay for this too, a particular expense since it melts into the dish. Olives, beetroot, gourds, onions, and many other choice items. You'd have heard a comedy, or a reader, or a lyre player, or, if I was feeling generous, all three. But you no doubt chose to dine with someone who gave you oysters, womb of sow, sea urchins, and dancing girls from Cadiz. Plinius. You're listening to a reading of an ill-tempered letter written almost 2,000 years ago. Its author is known to us today as Pliny the Younger, the lawyer whose letters are a rich and valued source for historians of ancient Rome. Pliny's letters deal with a vast array of subjects, from descriptions of Roman villas to the charms of rural life, from ghost stories to floating islands and the squalid art of legacy hunting. There's one event, though, for its dramatic and spectacular qualities that eclipses all others in Pliny's letters, and that is his eyewitness description of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. Pliny wrote of the cloud that first rose from the mountain like an umbrella pine tree, of the following morning that was blacker and denser than all the nights that had ever been, and the wild sea and the fierce wind, and the fate of his famous uncle, Pliny the Elder, who sailed fatefully towards the mountain across the Bay of Naples. The eruption of Vesuvius is central to the lives of Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger, And it's also at the centre of this episode of Travels Through Time, the podcast where we explore one year in history with an expert guest in three different scenes. We have a brilliant historian today to take us back to the history of that time. Dr Daisy Dunn is a writer, classicist and cultural critic. Her debut book, Catullus's Bedspread, The Life of Rome's Most Erotic Poet, was released to general acclaim in 2016, and now she's on the point of publishing her follow-up. In the Shadow of Vesuvius, A Life of Pliny, is a blend of history and biography. It's been praised by Sarah Bakewell as a wonderfully rich, witty, insightful, and wide-ranging portrait of the two Plinys. I met up with Daisy in central London last week to talk about these two famous figures, and the great event that shaped both of their lives. Hello, Daisy. Hello. Okay, before we get going with our travels, could I begin by asking you a really general question? What first drew you towards the ancient world? I think it was probably reading Homer, which I did in English when I was about nine or ten. I dipped into both the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I was completely overwhelmed and spellbound by just how wonderful these stories Mm. are. Between the the Greeks and the Romans, do you have any preferences? Do your interests really span the classical world or do you have any particular favourite bits you like to dip into? I'm kind of, within classics, I'm almost um, evenly spread between the two. At the moment, I've just been writing a book on Homer um, for one of those short ladybird expert books. So that's allowed me to sort of really dip into Greek literature, which I hadn't done for some time because Catullus had been Roman. Uh, The Pliny's I've written on most recently, Roman. And when I was doing my doctorate, it was largely more sort of on on the Roman side. But, I mean, I love Homer and I love the Greek tragedies. Mm. But also in terms of history, like the Roman history really grabbed me. I suppose doing one of those Ladybird books now, in a way, it's a nice continuation to that first moment when you came across Homer 
the age of nine all those years ago. Exactly, it took you, it took me back. It really did. So sitting down and thinking, you know, I was trying to write to write in a very, very accessible way, a very accessible introduction to Homer, and it's it's a real challenge boiling down something so vast into I think it's about twenty five pages, um, seven thousand words, and. Yeah, I ended up sort of thinking about it in those terms, like what was it like when you didn't know anything about Homer at all, you're trying to write about it in a way that is kind of readily understandable, but also lively and sort of getting to the heart of, of what Homer's all about as well. Okay. So you mentioned Catullus as well. You've you published two books on him and yeah. his poetry. And of course that is, is the first century BC, isn't it? So yeah. there's great figures like Caesar and Pompey the Great and and Cicero and Crassus. Now, today we're going to be talking about 100 years later, is that right? Yeah, they're about, so yeah, Catullus was 80 to 50, that kind of BC, mm. and we're talking about the, the two Plinies who are in the first century, and Pliny the Younger lives just into the early second century AD. So there's a massive difference in these two periods of history, though, even though they're separated by just 100 years. So much has happened in that gap. I mean, Catullus is living on, on the cusp where this of the Republic's crashing down all around him. His father was a friend of Julius Caesar, so he's kind of you know very right. close to all that happening. Now, with the Plinies, we're in the sort of high empire. We've got emperors, which we didn't have in Catullus's time. We had, uh, as you were saying, Caesar and Pompey and Crassus and all these sort of ambitious mm. demagogues sort of popping up all over the place. Now we've got actually spanning between the two Pliny's lives, we've got about 10 emperors in there, which is an enormous number. So there's this kind of great power struggle still going on in um, in Rome, as it always did, I suppose. But would people be looking back to the old Republican years with a sense of nostalgia, do you think, at this point? I think there's always people who are doing that, and that's always the constant worry and anxiety for the emperors, that suddenly there's going to be people sort of rising up trying to take it back to where they were, because if you look all the way back into much more ancient Roman history, I mean, the whole idea in the Republic of having anything like a monarchy was just so disgusting and so sort of you know, anti-Roman. They started with the kings, but then they went into um, the Republic and they were so sort of adamant they weren't going to go into any kind of, um, you know, inherited power and things mm. like that. And then suddenly you've got this. And then with the first Emperor Augustus, I think particularly in that period, you're wondering, is this forever now or is this going to be a temporary thing? And there's that constant anxiety as to so what sort of a world are we going to live in? Exactly. And the world they were living in, so this is first century AD, is a world where Rome is really at the height of its power, almost. It in, is. In the extent as well. How far was the Roman Empire ranging at this point? It's stretching. I mean, in depending on the younger's lifetime, it reaches its largest ever extent. So that's under the Emperor Trajan, um, who's the last emperor that Pliny the Younger lived to see. We've got, in the west, you've got Hispania, We've got the Roman provinces there, and then the east, we're going over to Syria, Judea, all of these provinces over on that side, and then you've got sort of North Africa as well. Mm. You've got Britain. I know you talk about the conquest of the Isle of Wight at one point in your book, which sounds, <laughs> or maybe the, the subjugation. Subjugation, yeah. Uh, no, that was, maybe um, conquest is a bit too grand a word, but it's, <laughs> it's a fun one all the same. But it just gives you an idea of how far and how finely tuned this empire must have been as a bureaucratic machine as much as anything. Exactly, and, and one of the questions that comes up a lot in my book and sort of with the younger Pliny is how do you control and manage an empire so vast? What do you do? You've got one emperor, how does he manage this? How does he sort of trust his sort of representatives and his governors who are going out to these various places? How do you actually keep that all together? Well, it's a fascinating question when you think that, I mean, if you think of the great empires of, of the modern periods of history, which were knitted together in, with, with, you know, incredible administrative machinery, of course, but they had advantages of, of technology that the Romans did not have. So mm -hmm. even the Victorians later on, when they had this famously large empire, were able to make use of things like telegraphs and postal mm -hmm. systems, which were incredibly efficient of course there was some postal systems of course working throughout the roman world but just i think what was interesting for me reading your book is seeing how these great figures were often thrown into administrative roles because yeah. it was it was really important to keep the machine running yeah for me it's fascinating thinking um so pliny the younger in his later life gets dispatched as a governor of the roman province of bithynia pontus which is on the uh, south coast of the black sea in what's now northern turkey 
and he's having to send all these letters backwards and forwards and we actually have the replies from Trajan and we know it took months really for each letter to wend its way all the way back to Rome but Pliny's kind of held back a bit by what he can do he feels he needs to ask the permission of Trajan you know, can I make this change can I fix this can I do that and he has to wait for the response to come back so he, the amount of time is wasted sort of in waiting um, just from you know the inability to, to sort of have a faster sort of means of communication it's really interesting so. Really interesting. Now, you've been mentioning Pliny, this character, who we're going to get to, and uh, I suppose we're using Pliny in the plural because there's two of them. Um, uh, yes. Pliny the Elder, best known as, and then, um, not surprisingly, Pliny the Younger, um, as ever to. We're going to look at them today through the year 79 AD, which might be ringing a few bells in a few people's minds already, but this is the moment which really brings these two Plinys together. Isn't that right? It is. Yeah, we have two Plinys. We have the elder is actually the maternal uncle of the younger. And in AD 79, Vesuvius erupts. This is the sort of crucial moment in, in the lives of both. Bit of a spoiler alert, the elder one dies mm. in this eruption. The younger one survives. When the younger Pliny moves on from this tragedy, he finds himself adopted as the son of the elder. Mm. So even though he's his, his uncle, he's also his adoptive son, sort of posthumously through his will. So mm. he takes his name, that's why he's known as Pliny, Plinius. All right, so, so 79 AD is a moment really which brings these two Plinys together. Let's go to your first scene, which is in June 79 AD, with the death of Vespasian. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Vespasian, yeah. Perfect. And the accession of Titus. Yeah. Tell us what's going on here. Okay, I thought this would be an interesting place to start um, because it's kind of the immediate background to this tragic moment, the eruption, mm. uh, which happens a few months later. So June eighty seventy nine, we've got Vespasian. He's on his deathbed. He's been emperor for the past 10 years. He's about 69 years old. And he has just got back from Campania in southern mm. Italy, which is actually where the volcano is. And he's come back and he's developed some kind of strange ailment. He's got some kind of stomach trouble. So he's gone back to one of his villas in Riate, in central Italy, which is the area where he was born. And he's dying. He knows he's dying. But sort of all the, the accounts we have, he's quite a sort of an optimistic man. He's quite a funny man. He's always joking. He was a military character, wasn't he? He he's was a military one of character. Nero's yeah. generals. He is basically looking looking back on his life and he's he's being very sort of jovial on this moment. He knows he's dying, he's slipping away, and he actually predicts as he dies that he's gonna be deified after his death. So supposedly his last words were, I think I'm becoming a god. Oh right. And he was right he was right. He was like um Augustus and Claudius before him. He was deified after his death, which meant that he was kind of seen in his own times having been a good emperor. Do you think he was saying this with a, an element of uh, jovality, as you say, or do you think it was a serious prediction of where he was going? I think it was a joke. Okay. I think this is sort of in, in uh, Suetonius, his biographer, uh, talks a lot about him sort of being you know, a bit of a wit okay. in his time. I think, I think it's a nice, I mean, whether that happened or not, we don't know, but I think it's quite a nice image, this sort of mm. picture of this man sort of slipping away, but still being very sort of optimistic and happy mm. in his final moment. And he is right, and he's deified, and I think, you know, that's a sign that he's been a good emperor. I wouldn't say he was a great emperor. His strength lay in his military role. That's really where he came from. He wasn't from one of these great families that was sort of destined to be in power. He was from kind of quite an obscure family of tax collectors, mm. as they in my book. But he really, he establishes himself as being a fantastic general in Nero's time. I mean, I think in his younger years, he's going, he does sort of tours of Germania. He comes to Britain. I think Suetonius says he manages to bring under Roman control two tribes, about 20 towns and the Isle of Wight. As and well. the Isle of Wight, so he's the Very one. importantly. So okay. he... <laughs> So he's credited with doing all of those things. Um, and then he really comes to the fore with the beginning of the Jewish uprising, which happens in AD 66. It's quite a sort of fraught subject, but basically um, the first emperor of Rome, Augustus, had established Judea as a Roman province in AD 6. This is all to do with the expansion of the empire into the east that you exactly. were talking about before. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and there's always been a sort of element of unrest and I think there's quite a lot of resentment among the Jews about the taxation that's coming from Rome. And then the final straw is um, Nero's governor seizes funds from the Temple of Jerusalem itself and then there's this great uprising which then Vespasian is sent to go and quell and that begins what we know as the Jewish war so and this was did this last for several years yeah so it's about AD 66 to uh, 73 74 
Mm. But this would be, uh, you talk about him as a military man. Is this the defining This is his com- defining moment, his really, moment, yeah. from that. And it's also the moment where Titus, his eldest son, his successor, really comes into the picture because he is sent out to help out in this same conflict. He goes off to that part of the world as well. And he's actually a key figure because in the midst of this, um, Vespasian's kind of interrupted in a way um, by the death of Nero. In AD 68, Nero dies. And suddenly there's a whole scrabble over the succession. And AD 69 became known as the year of the four emperors because civil war broke out over the succession. Um, and Vespasian happened to be the lucky fourth one, the fourth of the four emperors, and okay. managed to sort of stay on and be successful. Okay, so uh, interesting that you mentioned before that he wasn't from any prominence. He didn't come from... A background, one of the great families or anything like this, but you're talking about his son Titus mm. as a natural successor, maybe, in mm. a way. So that maybe gives us a bit of a hint of the power behind him. If he was able to establish himself as emperor and remain, you know, for 10 years or so, but then pass it on to his son. The really important thing with Titus is that he's almost a more natural successor to Emperor than Vespasian was. I mean, not only is he he's Vespasian's son, but he's actually brought up for some of his life, Suetonius says, alongside the Emperor Claudius's son, Britannicus, at the imperial court. The kind of conferral of honours. So he's actually more embedded in the imperial household than Vespasian ever was. Mm. And he's proven himself in the Jewish war. They actually, Vespasian and Titus, celebrate a joint triumph for their conduct in that war. The Colosseum that we see today, the, the Flaving Amphitheatre, as it's also known, is actually partly funded, supposedly, by spoils from the Jewish war. So that's kind of a big sort of a so symbol this, of their this success this lasting together. monument to, to that time, really, is a Colosseum. Yeah, and that's a sort of the beginning, and it kind of cements the Flavian, it's known as the Flavian dynasty. You've got Vespasian, Titus, and then Titus' younger brother, Domitian, uh, okay. succeeds him later on. So we're seeing this succession of emperors, and of course, at any moment when there's a transfer of power between one and the next, you get a different set of people all of a sudden appearing about. So is it with Titus that we get to... We get to Pliny the Elder. Um, right. This is the interesting thing. I mean, I think Pliny the Elder has... Um, he himself was a great military man. He conducted, we think, three tours of Germania, Germany. And on one of these, he actually meets the young Titus and becomes his tent mate. Mm which is interesting because later Henry the Elder's great work is the Encyclopedia of Natural History this 37 volume wonderful big work of scholarship and he dedicates that to Titus later and Pliny the Elder he starts out in the administration of Vespasian he is sort of part of that administration and he also conducts these procuratorships and sort of civil posts that took him overseas and we don't really know the details of those but we know that for one of them he went to Hispania Tarraconensis which is the largest Roman province in in Spain right, okay. to look after the imperial finances. So he's had an involvement with Vespasian, he's had an involvement with Titus while in Germania, in sort of Rhineland, sharing a tent with him. Quite sort of, they clearly had quite a good friendship, but we don't have very much information about what they were sort of doing there or sort of what okay. the nature of that was. Tell us a bit more about Pliny. He wouldn't be the elder at this point, would he? Because he's um, he's just Pliny. Well, we call him Pliny the elder. Exactly. Yeah, this, is he, all, this is our language today. But um, so what, what was he like in his time? He was... I think that if you were to sum him up in one word, it would be workaholic. Right. He was the kind of man who believed that to sleep was to lose half of your life. Mm. Um, so he didn't do it very much. He worked through most hours of the day. He was on his scholarship. And then he even said, when he wrote this, th- I mean, 37 volume encyclopedia is massive. The natural history covers absolutely everything you can imagine. Mm. He wasn't, I think, he wasn't one for walking at all. He actually liked to be carried around in a sedan chair. <laughs> He actually ticked. Was just to save time, was it? It was just to save time. He actually ticked off um, Pliny the Younger, his nephew, saying you could save all this time if you just travelled like I did by sedan chair. Pliny the Younger describes something of his work routine in his letters. He says that he wouldn't waste any time. So even when he's having dinner, he's, he's taking notes. Probably someone's reading to him. If he's in the carriage or if he's wherever he is sunbathing, he'd be working. Mm. The only time even, I think, when he's bathing, when he's being rubbed down, he'd be working. The only time he actually had to pause for the bath itself. In AD 79, he is... At this point, he's he's admiral of the fleet. So there, there are two imperial fleets. fleets. This yeah. is like the, the imperial fleet that's that's um, stationed at Mycenae, mm. which is in part of the Bay of Naples. It's about thirty kilometres away from. And it's the, the kind of northern lip, isn't it? Basically, Mycenae. Yeah. So yeah. he's there. He's in a villa, and Pliny the Younger, his nephew, and Pliny the Younger's mother, 
he's been the eldest sister, yeah. are with him in this villa at the time when Vesuvius arrived. Well, I think this is just a nice picture that we've got the Admiral, the person of real consequence, who's really in the prime of life, would you say? He's busily producing his yeah. works. He's just curious, isn't he? He's inherently curious. He also is he's anxious that we have knowledge of these of, of all kinds of things, but that knowledge is going to be lost unless someone writes it down. Yeah. And I think he's got... So there's a real um, impulse to do this. There's a real impulse, and it's particularly for... I mean, his, his, his book is kind of dedicated to the everyman. I mean, there are, I mean, farmers could find it useful. All kinds of people could find something of use in that book. But he's particularly anxious about the fact that it's only what he calls the rustics and the illiterate who know anything about plants anymore and their healing properties in particular. And he's anxious about the fact that particularly um, wealthier Romans are turning to sort of more Eastern medicines, like things from coming out from Turkey typically, yeah. um, and sort of different, not just medicines, but kind of practices to try and make yourself better. And he believed that actually the best medicines lay in the soil in Italy and we shouldn't be digging around for all kinds of sort of exotic things. We may as well learn what those plants can do for us. And that's why his, I mean, a lot of his encyclopedia is full of these really cr crazy to our eyes <laughs> sort of medicines and, and cures and different treatments for, for different ailments, um, all made up of plants and natural things that you can find in Italy. Well, I think we've got a real picture of Pliny the Elder there, probably best sum summarised in... Uh, shall I have a go at a bit of Latin here? Yes, do. Vita Vigilia Est, is yeah, that right? Yeah, or Vita Vigilia Est. <laughs> Not too well then. But anyway, what, what does that mean in, um, if we were to, to say today? I've got the translation here if you if you need me to supply it. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's to be alive, is to be awake. Yeah, exactly. It's a wonderful summary of his, his approach to life, his attitude, isn't it? Let's go to the second scene, which of course, I think people might know what's coming here, because the <laughs> Bay of Naples, it's uh, 79 AD, again we're still in the same year when when are we talking about well, this is one of those questions which has been debated for years and years and years when exactly in AD 79 did Vesuvius erupt mm. and most people are now think it actually happened in August 79 AD and there are lots of reasons why people are particularly archaeologists are anxious to change that date I mean it's partly to do with what they found when archaeologists have gone to Pompeii and Herculaneum and they've dug things up and they found sort of evidence of a lot of autumn fruits which are usually harvested a lot later than August. So of course first thing if we were travelling back through time to 79 AD we'd work out what the date was that would probably be our first. That would be our first, be first, <laughs> our job first to thing do. to do. Okay but we, we might not know the date for sure and whether that matters um, so much is debatable but we do have a wonderful account of what happened on the day. Yes. Um, do you want to talk us through? Okay. Um, because we know you were talking about um, Pliny, or both Plinys, being together, yeah, yeah, in Mycenae. Exactly. Before I say anything, what, everything I'm about to say next is based on the account of Pliny the Younger that he himself wrote of what he witnessed. And this was written almost 30 years later. So he describes, he's in a house, he's, he's with his uncle and he's with his mother, and his mother notices an enormous cloud rising in the distance and she alerts her brother to this the elder Pliny and he's working but he's really curious so he gets his shoes and he makes his way to a higher vantage point to get a better view of it and he sees it but he's not satisfied he wants to get a lot closer and see this thing up close so he asks his nephew the younger Pliny who's 17 at this time whether he'd like to get in a boat with him sail across the bay and approach this phenomenon as he sees it. The younger Pliny, even though he's a 17-year-old boy, he says, no, 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 I've got too much work. You, you know, he, the uncle had given him some work earlier that day. I'd rather stay at home with mum and carry on with my, my work, which you know, is a really life-saving decision in that moment. Little does he know it. Um, so Pliny the Elder goes alone, and he's about to leave when he receives a message from one of his friends who lives much closer to the volcano and she tells him she's begging him for help basically she says there's now no escape except by boat so it's in that moment the younger Pliny tells us that the elder Pliny changed his plan and what he'd begun is very much an intellectual pursuit he then turned into a rescue operation so he's got the whole fleet at his disposal so he launches the quadriremes which is the larger um, swifter ships and goes across with the fleet trying to rescue not only his friends so he's not going on his own he's, he's taking several he's taking all these people with him to yeah. try and save him he, he wants to save as many people on that shore because I mean the key thing about this is that 
He'd written about some volcanoes in his Encyclopedia of Natural History, but he hadn't described Vesuvius as a volcano. He described it simply as a mountain that was covered in vineyards and visible from Pompeii and watered by the River Sarno. And I don't think he had any idea that Vesuvius was a volcano, and there's no reason why he would have done. Volcanologists now know that it had been dormant for 700 years when it started erupting in AD 79. So I suppose this is the thing, we have a very strong picture of, of Vesuvius, don't we, in our in our imaginations of the kind of, you know, spurting lava and all the rest of this. But are you suggesting that it might have been a much greener place at that time and that it might have been almost concealed? It looked completely different. I mean, I, I think we've got a wall painting and that shows this one single king. We think of it being as this double cone. At the time, it was one one single, very very tall cone, and it was covered in vineyards and mm. greenery, and sort of you know, it, was a, it was a very fertile place. It, it didn't, yeah, it didn't look how it looks today. So it really wasn't obvious to them what was happening mm. at all, and that's why I mean, when it starts to erupt, people come up with all kinds of crazy explanations and stories as to what's going on. I mean, some people even imagine that giants are suddenly roaming the landscape. They yeah. don't know what's going on. But it doesn't I mean it's a phenomenon for him. He's wanting to get close to it, but he's kind of that plan scuppered by the fact that pumice is now raining down from the sky, and this pumice forms these sort of islands on the water, and he can't reach his friends, so he has to put in at a port town called Stabii, which is just sort of south of Pompeii. It's about 16 kilometres from the volcano. Yeah. He has a friend there, and he sort of goes to his house, has dinner, stays overnight, and then during the night they have to decide what to do because the pumice is now so tall they're going to be hemmed in and you know buildings are starting to collapse there are earthquakes that's another thing that's accompanying this eruption he finds that this, this time there's no way that they can get out and it, i mean it's this is the moment when he realizes that, that everything's nothing, changed yeah it's a hopeless situation it's hopeless and realizes that and i mean he asks for a drink and at that point is when everything's getting disastrous. I mean, he doesn't know what's happened. He doesn't know at this point that this this a massive cloud that they'd seen on the previous days kind of collapsed into itself. And there's been about six pyroclastic surges coming from the volcano. And already these have smothered and destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum, which are that much closer to the volcano. And we're 16 kilometres further away. Yeah. From the from the volcano, yeah. so Herculaneum is about seven kilometres away from the volcano. Yeah. Stabia is about sixteen. The six of these pyroclastic so you can kind of see the edge of this at Stabii, but it's not that that kills him. Um, from the elders on the beach at that time, he seems to collapse, and I think he seems to be asphyxiated. Mm. What we know about Pliny the Elder, so mentioned earlier, he's been carried around on his sedan chair a lot. He's quite portly, he's quite overweight, he's, mm. he's in his mid-50s. And even before this moment, he suffers from breathing difficulties. He's got kind of raw, narrow airways, which I think is probably asthmatic. That would be my sort of diagnosis of him posthumously. I suppose that day, if you want to break it down into the iconic moments, there's obviously the beginning of, of noticing that something is wrong. Then we go from that to this really pivotal point when they receive the letter and the this is like the division of the family, isn't it? Mm. When you get one Pliny going and one staying. And then Pliny, the youngest, staying with his mother. He's meanwhile in Mycenaeum and he's that much further away so they can escape and they're okay. But even there, it's like huge dangers are being trampled by crowds uh, and all of this. I mean, Pliny describes this in his letters very, very vividly. You've got this, um, this quote from Pliny the Elder, I think just on the point of leaving when he says, fortune favours the, the brave. brave. Yeah. It sounds almost cliche, doesn't it, in a way? But it's, is this, this is maybe where the cliche comes from. Well, it's a very Roman attitude, maybe, isn't it? It's a very Roman attitude. But you do you know. write it as well about how far the effects of the eruption were felt. Yeah, that's a, that was really surprising to me before I started researching this book. I had no idea. Apparently it, sort of, it blocked out um, the light in Rome. Mm. which is hundreds of kilometres away mm. and they had no idea what was going on there they, I mean they thought the world was being turned upside down and then mm. we, the volcanic dust as well reaching Egypt and sort of North Africa and Syria as well the volcano was sort of the lower slopes at least planted with, with vineyards and all kinds of things and it's alive it's mm. really really alive and I think it comes back to life there are parts of it even sort of 20 years later they now think that they've got evidence of, of vegetation sort of returning to that area and I suppose the last thing just to mention is that it all seems to take place in what is essentially 
a natural theatre, an enormous natural theatre, which is the Bay of Neapolis Bay of and yeah. the Bay of Naples. Yeah, yeah, it's just this kind of great bay. So we'll leave it there because I don't think we can improve on that. But that's a really good description. And we're going to go from that to, um, to your third scene, which is in Rome. OK, so the third scene I thought would go to Rome. One of my driving questions for writing this book was what on earth happened to Pliny the Younger after he survived the volcano, I mean, this, this volcanic eruption, he's 17 years old, what happened next? That was sort of my, my burning question to sort of explore his life. He's still very young, 17. 17, really, really young. Like, what do you do next? What happens? Um, so that's why his letters, you know, he left behind 10 books of letters are so useful. And he describes, um, I think it's within a year or about a year after the eruption, so really, really short time, he's embarking on his career and he's in the a court in Rome called the Kenton Wirral Court or the Court of 100 Men and this is a court for civil cases and he um, based himself within the Basilica Julia, Basilica Julia which is in the Roman Forum uh, it's a beautiful multi-storied building. Okay, this is one of the more important courts? It's, a, it's now, I mean I think the Testa says that it was sort of, it, was, it had been obscured for a while but now it's kind of re-established uh, re itself as a quite important course and it's quite technical work that's involved there. I think one thing to say about Pliny the Younger, he's quite pedantic, um, right. he's very much one of those men who likes the small print of things and this, but this suits him, this is, you know, this kind of work is perfectly suited to Pliny the Younger's personality. He's required to look at wills and examine cases to do with inheritance. Maybe this is all a response to having been a bit traumatised, you know, in, in the Bay <laughs> of Naples. He's gone back to something a bit more, um, a bit more sedate. Maybe. Well, I think you can, you can read so much into it. I think it's particularly the fact that, I mean, that Pliny the Elder's own will had such a bearing on Pliny the Younger's life. I and mean, Pliny the Younger inherits, he takes his name from him, essentially, because he's adopted as his son right. after Pliny the Elder dies. I think that's important. That creates a connection between them. He also inherits um, an estate um, that he had, an agricultural estate in what's now Perugia, and 160 of his notebooks, double-sided and written in the very smallest handwriting. Oh, the younger puts it. So I he's can got detect this... a knowing voice here. <laughs> <Is that> right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So he's got all these things, but then he's also, I think, determined to make you know, a life for himself. He needs to find his own direction. So he, he joins this court and he, he's got to become a great orator. That's his great ambition, to be a fantastic orator. And he writes a lot in his letters about his efforts to try and learn to speak really, really well. And he talks about his influences. He talks about Demosthenes from mm. ancient Athens. He talks about Cicero and how he loves the sort of rhetorical flourishes of Cicero. Um, and also a guy called Calvus. So we were talking about Catullus earlier. Calvus mm. was one of Catullus's really close friends who was both a poet and... Um, a lawyer in the first century. So century the tradition of oratory, which obviously is very connected with, I mean, I think of Cicero before anyone else, I suppose that's the general reaction. Is it still as strong as ever in Rome at this point? I think it is. I mean, I think um, we don't know. I mean, it's interesting that we know more about Cicero and Pliny the Younger from a personal point of view and just from an oratorical point of view than we do probably most other Romans. And like, I think Pliny the Younger is a very different kind of orator from someone like Cicero. But here, but here back in 79 or 80... Yeah, so it's 18... Yeah, 18 19, it's not so. long after the, the eruption, really. That's what's really surprising, yeah. I think, for, for me. I think you immediately, as a modern reader, you think, God, he must have had some time to sit down and try and get over that and cope with that. But no, he's straight in there and he is trying to establish himself in this law court which will be sort of his main he calls it his arena right um, so he's got grand ambitions and he really wants to be counted among you know the constellation the of or orators that have come out of yeah but it's, it's difficult because I, mean, I think as a court itself it doesn't always attract the most sort of fascinating cases that you could have at this time you know a lot of them i mean like he said even he had to admit a lot of the work is quite quite dry Drudgery, really I mean yeah. it's, it's it's wills and it's mm. in her, I, I don't think that I'm not a lawyer but I wouldn't say that was probably the most sort of interesting area yeah. necessarily but he really does make the most of it and you do find some quite juicy stories that he comes across I mean in one case he's sort of representing this woman called Atia Viriola and he's defending her because her elderly father who's in his 80s I think he has met a woman had a 10-day romance with her married her and now he's seeking to take away uh, the daughter's patrimony 
So Vinny defends her, and I mean, he says he's really surprised at the fact that the jury at this time are really divided because some of them are just like, wow, you know, go for it, man, to the, the older <laughs> man, like really sort of admiring the older man and his sort of gumption, and the other people are sort of all on, on the girl's side. And he then he says, you know, I made this marvellous speech. It was very intricate. It was like uh, the description, Virgil's description of Aeneas's armour in the Aeneid, or something, you know, something crazy like this. Um, and, you know, he gets very, very, he's very proud of what he's done, and he's managed to defend and you know, he wins. I suppose these, these cases always take you into the social history, don't you? And they that's do. That's one of the exciting things because it, it is quite a bit of drudgery to go back into these wills and courts. But they do. It's really, really important. Yeah. And I think it's, it's important for us also knowing what's going on at this time because he actually has an enemy in this court, a guy called Regulus, and he can't stand this man. Like, really, really can't. He doesn't understand how he's got anywhere as an orator. He doesn't like his style of speaking. He doesn't like the fact he uses notes to read. He doesn't like the fact also he's just a really, really crooked man. And he he accuses him of actually being a legacy hunter. So if you think you're actually working in a court in which you're supposed to be protecting people's wills and making sure that people are inheriting what they ought to be inheriting, you have this man called Regulus who's supposedly, according to Pliny, hanging around people when they're sort of on their deathbeds and trying to persuade them to change their wills and you know get him some, some of the money. And Regulus is actually very, very rich. And he's Pliny himself, Pliny the Younger himself, is very, very rich, but Regulus is said to be sort of enormously so. So I think there's a lot of sort of envy probably between them at the same time. And I think this is a sort of interesting aspect I was trying to pursue in my book. And you might think a book about a lawyer, you know, what can you do with that? But actually it is so much more interesting than you initially anticipate. I Absolutely. Think. And so here we, we'd be seeing him at the start of this career, yeah. which was to stretch on for a long time. For a long time, yeah. So this is him at the very, very beginning. He has a lot to get through ahead of him at this stage. So he's starting out. So Titus, he was only emperor for a, a few months when Vesuvius erupted. Yeah. And he is actually short-lived after that. I mean, he, he dies, I think, in AD 81. So there's only a couple of years of... A couple of years, yeah. yeah. And then you've got his dastardly younger brother, Domitian, who right. comes in. And he is kind of the pivotal figure in Pliny the Younger's life, particularly his professional life. And he's having to serve him. He's in his Senate. Um, he's also continuing with his legal work. And Pliny the Younger gets roped into situations where he finds it very, very difficult to escape. He doesn't know what to do because he finds himself sort of against his own friends. He's befriended um, a lot of Stoic philosophers mm. in Rome, and you have this whole thing which is known, so we call it the Stoic opposition, but basically Domitian exiled and put to death a number of these Stoic philosophers. And then Pliny's kind of there, and it's the Senate who has him to sort of overlook. He's kind of involved in this, and it's awful for him, and he's like not knowing what to do, and he gives the impression that he hates Domitian, but bear in mind he's writing his letters after Domitian's died, so he's, it's in his interest to present himself as being, yeah. you know, but you have to read the letters very carefully thinking, well, Domitian must have thought something of Pliny to have kept him there, they must have had, you know, a reasonably okay mm. relationship, but then, obviously mm. after his death, what Pliny does in his letters, he's trying to show himself as being very much hating Domitian, he, he calls him a bit monster, he calls him everything else, but to be very, very close with Trajan later, who was one of the good emperors. Bear in mind, he's writing his letters after Domitian's died, so he's, it's in his interest to present himself so as being... Yeah. But Pliny the Younger, he seems to me, he, he's got all this kind of city life, he's got you know, his career, which is very important to him, but he often seems to be at his happiest when he is at one of his estates, and he's looking at his sort of fruit trees, and he's looking at his mm. vineyards, and he says, you know, you know, a man uh, only needs to sort of walk down his paths and count his fruit trees to be happy. He says, I think he's really interested in all of this, and he sort of makes his own wine. I think that is this kind of respect for nature and this understanding that it's actually good for you to break from your work and go out and exercise and have you know a bit of a stroll and look at the world around you and I think that he shares that in common with the elder Pliny. So as a commentator in the 21st century Pliny the Younger would probably have a few words of advice for us today. But... I think so I think that I mean the nature thing really does strike a chord I mean I think we're now at the moment, right now, is the Chelsea Flower Show. And that's a lot of the news <laughs> this morning, you know, about so these gardens which are trying to help children go outside and people go outside. And it's great for your mental well being, it's good for your mental health to get this balance of being outside. And, you know, you could say the thing he's got there way before us. Yeah, but I suppose it's in this court of 100 men that we, that we went to straight away, which was his most natural context, mm. maybe. And you say that it was actually more than 
a hundred men in there sometimes, 180. Yeah, so by now, like more or less, it's always 180 men, um, four tribunals. Um, and but plenty of room for spectators as well, so a lovely little spot for us to sit by People and watch on yeah. as Pliny started his career, which was going to go on. He left a lot of information behind, didn't he? So he's left a lot of documents for us today. He has. He's got um, sort of between three and 400 letters arranged over 10 books. They document so many different aspects of his life from the courtroom to his villas to everything, the eruption, everything at that time. And I think it's really interesting what you've done here because we've got these two characters are often blended. This is one of the points you make right at the beginning. They're often blended into one character in our memory, Pliny. Yeah, it's just not Pliny. Just Pliny. You've stuck a great volcano in between them and separated them <laughs> into their constituent parts. And it's a wonderful idea. I really enjoyed it. And just tell us a little bit more about the book. Is, is there any particular anecdotes you want to tell us about? What, what did you learn whilst writing this? It was a long process of research mm. yeah, I started with all the primary sources looking at the letters and then trying to read the encyclopedia which obviously took a long time reading it all in Latin did you get and right translating through it. the encyclopedia yeah and like there's so much that you want to bring in that's the thing mm. it's this great thing and there's just so many anecdotes but how do you weave all of those into a narrative and keep it sort of flowing so I kind yeah. of had to pick stuff from all of the books um, in there and woven it in sort of where it, where it's sort of relevant to their lives and where it kind of show, it throws new light on them. So I've tried to weave together these two men, their two lives and sort of their work as well. So the natural history of the encyclopedia is just full of wonderful information and so much about oysters. And I mean, one thing he says, um, Pliny just says about oysters, which I just find fascinating is how um, in deeper waters oysters tend to be small because it's dark and that they're sad so they look less for food oh. there's all these things I think it's just so wonderful there's so much about there's a bit of poetry in there as well isn't there there is yeah there's a lot of poetry <laughs> there's in there. a lot of poetry and Pliny the Younger was a sort of he, he kind of fancied himself as a bit of a poet he actually wanted to be like Catullus that was who, who he idolised oh, okay. as a poet and Pliny the Younger I'm, I'm sorry to say he just wasn't a natural <laughs> at writing poetry and you read it and you think oh Pliny you know stick to the day job <laughs> <laughs> okay so well what Let's ask you one more question, though, um, because we're coming back. So we've been from our three scenes, which all oscillate really around this eruption and show us the different sides um, of these two characters, but also of Roman society at the time. If you could bring one object back with you from AD 79 to 2019, what would mm, you like to bring? Really hard. I, one thing I'd love to have is one of these notebooks, which has passed through both of the Pliny's hands. So one of these 160 small handwriting, tiny double-sided oh, right. of the elder Pliny, which the younger Pliny then inherited. I'd like to have seen what he actually did with those, where he kept it. Oh. Um, and also I think looking at people's handwriting would show you so much. I mean, he clearly writes in a tiny, he's very, very precise. That tells you a lot about the personality, I think. Yeah. So it'd be fantastic to be actually hold something like that. What, a, what an object. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Daisy Dunn, <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much for travelling through time with us today. Thank you. It's great fun. Well, that was me, Peter Moore, talking with Dr. Daisy Dunn about the two Plinies, the elder and the younger, just last week. Her book's a real trove of information about the Roman world. And what she does is um, really use these two biographies as ways into unexpected histories. Over here, you have Pliny the Elder with his encyclopedia and interest in the natural world. And over, over there, you have Pliny the Younger with his legal practice and his social interests. And between them, they cover a vast amount of ground. In the middle, of course, you have the eruption itself bringing things together. The book is called In the Shadow of Vesuvius, and it's out right now. It comes recommended by me. You can find out much more as ever on the History Today website. There's articles about Vesuvius's eruption, including one written by Daisy herself called Before and After the Volcano Blows, and another when the Romans met the Christians for the first time. These are really worth looking up and I'd encourage you to do so if you're interested in exploring this a bit further. For me, please do subscribe to our podcast feed if you want to get the first news of our next episode. But for now, that's it. And I just want to say thank you very much for listening in. <laughs>